All right, we're in the book of Ephesians, so get your Bibles out if you have them, and, or your phone, whatever you use, and we will get to it. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you together to come into this place to fellowship with other believers and to draw attention to lift you high. And Lord, we know as we do that in this place that you're going to draw men to yourself. You're going to draw people to yourself as we lift up the name of Jesus here in this place. And Lord, we just invite your word strategically to come into our heart. We just give a, a formal invitation. Say, come, have your way. Come do, the, do your thing in us. And, and we want to walk out of this place a little bit different, hopefully a lot different than when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, quick poll. How many of you guys have battled any sort of anxiety or anxiousness in 2018 so far that you would just, just admit to? Like, I've battled anxiety. All right, just hold up your hand. That's right, because there's a lot of people, okay? So you're not going to be alone in this. All right, several of us have battled that. Now, we know that just because we're battling it, we know that God doesn't, how many guys really believe that God doesn't want us to battle that? Anybody believe that? Okay, all right, let me just show it to you in scripture. We're going to jump, first of all, in Philippians chapter 4. Okay, so Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, it says, do not be anxious about anything. How many of you guys have ever had a hard time living out this one right here? Don't be anxious about anything, and that, that's what it says. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Is there anybody here who would like some of that peace that would guard your heart, guard your mind in Christ Jesus? That is God's will for our life. He wants us to walk in peace. And when we're experiencing anxiety and anxiousness, we're not walking in God's best for our life. So I want to first off just give you some reasons as to why we might experience anxiousness. Because sometimes, we talked about it uh, the last few weeks, that whenever you drag something out of the dark and bring it into the light, that's when God can really work with it, right? So let's just drag some reasons out of the darkness, the hidden spots, as to why we become anxious from time to time. I'm going to give you three. Uh, the, the first one is this. We get anxious about things that we have. How many of you guys have ever been anxious about stuff that you have? And let me just take this approach. How many of you guys have kids? All right. How many of you guys have ever been anxious about kids, about what's going on in their life, about why, what, what's going to happen? Are they ever going to do Are they ever going to get up and clean their room? Are they ever going to do whatever? And you get anxious about kids. How many of you guys have a house that's like, it, it wasn't a fixer-upper. It's like always a fixer-upper. How many of you guys have one of those houses, right? And so you're always worried something's going to break. Something's got to be fixed. As soon as you paint something, then, then something else happens over here. And so we're always worried about the stuff that we've got and maybe the things that are already in our life, they create anxiousness in our life. One of my favorite stories or illustrations of this is Dr. James Dobson. Years ago, he had young kids in the house and he was really feeling convicted by God to spend more time with his young kids. He was busy. And how many of you guys ever get busy? And all of a sudden you kind of like, man, I got to right the ship. I got to spend some more time with the kids. And so he was walking through a store one day and he saw this big, huge, shiny, fancy uh, playground set, this swing set. And it was just impressive. And he said, that's it. I'm going to buy that. And he just could see himself out in the backyard playing with his kids throughout the springs, playing with his kids throughout the summer, enjoying the fall out there, hanging out with the kids. And so he ordered it. And he said, the problem is I ordered the exact model, but what came to me was not exactly like what I saw. Because what came to me came to me in a long box <laughs> containing, as he describes it, Roughly 6,324 pipes, 28,487,651 bolts, 28,487,650 screws, and a set of instructions that would have confused Albert Einstein. And so he spent the next two days of his life assembling this piece of thing that was supposed to bring him happiness and joy with his kids. And so he finally stands up the, the shaky structure that he's constructed. How many of you guys have ever done this before? And, and so he stands it up and to his horror, he reads the very last line of the instructions, which says this, Please retighten all the bolts on this apparatus every two weeks to ensure safety and durability. So he's going to now have to spend every second Saturday of his life retightening these bolts to make sure this swing set doesn't kill his kids. That's what he's going to have to do. How many of you guys know that sometimes it seems like 
with the things that we own have the potential to own us after a while, don't they? They will either own us just in our attention or they will own us in our time. How many of you guys have ever realized that it seems like the more we accumulate, the more our worries accumulate? The more stuff we have, the more stuff we have to worry about. You realize this happens in our relationships as well. The more relationships we have surrounding our life. How many of you guys have ever experienced that before? That it seems like your worries can increase the more you surround yourself with. Okay, And there's nothing wrong with relationships, but it just is the fact. A, a few years ago, we lived in just this, this small house, and it di we didn't really have anything really of value. <laughs> you know, And it, we just didn't really have anything. And I, I remember hearing this another couple that I knew, they, they had a lot of stuff. They had a lot of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. They had a lot of stuff. And they had gone away on a trip and some stuff had gotten stolen while they were gone. And so they were getting ready to go on another trip and they were freaked out because they had all this stuff, all this valuable stuff that they were concerned with them leaving and what would happen to it. And I was thinking to myself, man, I would love for somebody to come in and take all my stuff. <laughs> and yet, see, I didn't, I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't worried about it. Why? Because it seems like the more stuff we have, the more stuff we have to worry about. How many of you guys have ever experienced that before? Maybe even right now. You're concerned about what you have in the bank and is it doing the good, a good enough job and your investments and we could just go down the list. It seems like the more we have, the more we have to worry about. So it produces anxiousness. Uh, next thing is this, we get anxious about things we don't have. How many of you guys have ever had some needs? Maybe you need some clothes. Maybe you're looking for the, the grocery bill. Like, how am I going to pay the grocery Maybe you had a bill. How many of you guys have ever had a bill that you did not have the money to pay at the time? Yeah, you get it in the mail. I don't have the money to pay. And so you're anxious about what you don't have. You don't have the money. It produces anxiousness in us. What about tomorrow? How many of you guys have ever been anxious about tomorrow? Boy, I don't even have to ask for a show of hands because it's everybody, even though if I did, some of you guys wouldn't and you'd be liars, okay? That's just what it would be, okay? So it's okay to admit this, okay? We're all in this together. But we worry about tomorrow. We don't have tomorrow yet, and yet we're worried about it. And Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. You don't have it yet. Tomorrow, when you get there, then deal with it. But don't worry about what you don't have. Have you guys have ever worried about your future? What's going to happen in my future? What's going to happen with my job? What's going to happen with my family? What's going to happen with my career? What's going to happen with my life? And yet, we, if we begin to focus on all of these things, because how many of you guys know, you don't have the future yet. And yet, we worry about what we don't have. Let me give you a third thing. See, we, we get anxious about what the things we have, anxious about things we don't have. How many of you guys have ever been anxious about things that other people had? Anybody? Here's what I mean. The comparison trap. You see, somebody else has a promotion. And you, how many of you guys have ever been in this situation when somebody else gets a promotion or something good happened to them? And the first thing that comes to your heart is not celebration, but it's like, why not me? It wasn't even about you. It wasn't going to affect your life in any way. Maybe somebody gets a new house, a new possession, a new opportunity, a new whatever it is, a new car. And our first thought, even though it doesn't affect us in the least, is to become anxious. Why do we become anxious about that? Because we're constantly caught up in this comparison trap that I talked about the last couple of weeks that, uh, about our value. And, and what we have sometimes equals our value. And so we get caught up in that over and over and over again. Why don't I have what they have? Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. It says, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. But envy makes the bones rot. That's a great refrigerator verse if you want to choose one out. Just slap up there. Just remind yourself. Rotting bones. This is what the Bible says happens to us on the inside whenever envy and jealousy begins to happen. It's like we're rotting from the inside. Vine's Expository Dictionary translates that Greek word envy as this. Listen and see if you identify with this in any way, shape, or form. The feeling of displeasure produced by witnessing or hearing of the advantage or prosperity of others. Whenever we've felt that on the inside, that's envy. And the Bible says that the fruit of that will be a rotten, a, things rotting on the inside of us. 
our spirit, our, our, our soul begins to kind of just something begins tainted about that. And we have fear of losing what we have, maybe even to another, or fear of somebody else getting ahead. It seems like some people who, you know, if, if they don't have anything in their life to worry about, have you guys ever known somebody that if they didn't have anything to worry about, they would find something to worry about or find somebody else, else's problems to worry about, right? Just constant worriers, you know? So I'm not talking about extreme issues of this. I'm just talking about to us in general ways, dealing with general life, if we find ourselves in anxiety and anxiousness over what the things we have, over the things we don't have, over the things that other people have, guess what? We are not going to experience the peace of God. Again, how many of us want to experience peace? Anybody? Okay, it's about half hands now. I don't know why, it's about half the hands. I think we all want to experience peace. Here's the truth. You can't be anxious and at peace simultaneously. You can't be anxious and at peace at the same time, according to the scripture. Now, I want you to pay attention to what I didn't say. I didn't say, when I talk about peace, I didn't say freedom from trouble. Peace is not freedom from trouble. Because you can have peace even in the trouble, right? God doesn't promise us freedom from all trouble. In fact, it says you're probably going to have some. But what we are promised is that we can experience and walk out and live in peace with God, even in our problems, even in our problems. So here we go. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18. Here's our key scripture that we're looking at in the book of Ephesians, key scriptures. Just going to look at a couple of them, but they're powerful. Do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I read that and I'm thinking, addressing one another in psalms? <laughs> Does anybody get nervous when you read the Bible every once in a while? It's like, are we really supposed to do this? You know, Because that would just be awkward if we did that. I don't know if that really, it works that way. Jim, would you come on up here? No, come on. Jim's, would you come up here? Jim's, I'll get somebody up here, okay? Jim's, just, just, yeah, give Jim's a big hand. All right. All right, Jim's, just, just come over here and just, just come on up here, Jim's. Like, right, man, your shoes are looking snazzy, man. That is awesome, man. Okay, so I don't, I don't think it's supposed to look like this. If I just picked a random, like, song that we sing and I'm just like, whoa. Here I stand, arms open wide. I knew he'd do it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> or, or I could even say it this way. I could just prophesy over your life. I could just sing, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I could just do that. And give Jim's a big hand. Give him a big hand. I love this guy. Now, if I went around doing that, now, maybe they did that back in the day, but if I went around doing that today, you probably think I was drunk with wine, as it talks about in verse 18. But what I really think is going on there for us today, you know, how many of you guys have ever got a song stuck in your head? You guys ever get those songs? Like, and it's always the stupid songs that you get stuck in your head. It's never a good song. It's always a stupid song. And so sometimes I'll get a song stuck in my head. Do you realize you can get a song stuck in your heart? It talks about the melody of your heart. I believe what this is talking about is this. What is the melody in your heart? Is it a melody of anxiousness and worry and negativity that's stuck on repeat in any situation? And your default is this stuck song. It's stuck on repeat and it's anxiousness. It's anxiety. It's tension. It's negative thoughts. It's worry. You see, that's what happens sometimes when we get filled with anxiousness. So how do we stop doing this? How do we stop doing this? Well, before we get that, I'm going to show one of my favorite clips of all time, just to kind of set you in the mood of sometimes how, uh, how we get caught up in worrying and maybe some, some ways we can get out of it. And it's, it's not this simple, but this is a lot of fun. So let's roll it. Well, tell Why? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. 
has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it. I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, childhood. No, no, no. We, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. What, what, what else? Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! You, you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, Yes. Well, then stop it. <laughs> Don't be such a big baby. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! <laughs> how, how are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook. Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! <sighs> what's, what's the problem, Kathy? I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. So you think we're, we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me, uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want to you get a pad and a pencil for this one? All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here are the ten words. Stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box! Ooh, okay, yeah, all right. How do you guys know? It's, it's, sometimes it's just not that simple, right? But I, I, will, I will tell you that, that what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to seem simplistic. But here's what I want you to know. Just because it's simple, it's not whether it's complex or not that makes the difference. It's whether we apply it or not that makes the difference. Come on, is anybody with me this morning? All right, so I'm going to tell you some things as to what I believe, how we can walk in peace. How do we, how do we stop it? How can we turn our worry into worship? And I believe this, the antidote to anxiousness is the attitude of gratitude. Okay, that sounds like a nice little saying, but I'm telling you there's so much truth in this statement. The antidote to anxiousness is an attitude of gratitude. And the question really is, are you a worrier or are you a worshiper? Again, it's not in the complexity, it's in the application. Are we worriers or are we worshipers? How many of you guys have ever heard this statement that comparison is the thief of joy? So whenever we get into this anxiety and comparison and, and all of this stuff, it steals the joy that God has put in our life and wants us to experience. How many of you guys have ever heard this statement? Familiarity breeds contempt. Anybody? So in other words, the more familiar we are with something, the less important it becomes to us. And eventually we start to even despise it or to disregard it altogether. 
How many of you guys have ever experienced that in some area? Let me give you an, an illustration that I've shared before. When I was first married and in and, and the younger days of our marriage, we, I had a Ford Escort. I mean, this was like a Ford, a little red Ford Escort hatchback. I burned the clutch out of it like seven times. And uh, so I got tired of doing that, and I decided I'm going to get a different vehicle. And so we were kind of looking around a little bit. But one day I went out without telling Becca where I was going. I went out to the dealership, and I bought a brand new, loaded up Ford Mustang, brand shiny, new, spanking new, every single option on the thing. I brought it home and I said, look, honey, what I bought. How many of you guys know that is not good marriage advice right there? We're going to talk about that next week. Okay, we're going to get into marriage. It's going to be great. Okay, I'm going to tell you what not to do, but just, to, just so you know, that's probably what not to do. And so I brought it home and it was great. I love that thing, but here's what I realized. How, how many of you guys know? The second that I drove the Mustang off the dealership lot, what happened to it? It went down in value, didn't it? I mean, it skyrocketed downward in value. I mean, I mean, just the moment, the mere seconds it took for the bumper to cross over the property line was all it took for it to spiral in value. How many guys have ever experienced that before? Now, let me ask you a question. What changed? Did anything on the car change? Not a thing changed about the car in the few seconds it took for me to drive across the property line. What changed? The way people looked at the car changed. Not a thing about the car changed, only the way people looked at the car. And because people looked at the car different, it did what? It depreciated. It was not as valuable as it once was. Now, Appreciation equals value. Here's what I want to suggest to us today when we're talking about familiarity breeds contempt. I believe that many of us in our life right now are anxious about things we don't have. And here's why we're anxious. God has, given, has already given us things that we've driven off the lot. And as soon as we drove them off the lot, nothing changed about the house. Nothing changed about the car. Nothing changed about the spouse. Nothing changed except for the way we looked at what we already have. And that causes a depreciation in value. Nothing changed except for our attitude towards it. How many of you guys have kids that you want, I mean, they want something for Christmas. They want something really bad for Christmas. I was just watching this show last night. How many kids grew up, guys grew up as kids in the 80s and you played with G.I. Joes? Anybody? G.I. Joes? Yeah, wherever there's, how many guys are just flashbacks right now? It's just go Joe, right? So I was watching this show last night about the, the toys and stuff and they showed this one toy that if you were a guy growing up in that era, you know what I'm talking about. How many of you guys remember the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier? This thing was like seven feet long. This was amazing. I mean, very few people had it. I had one guy that I, I, I it was rumored to have it, right? You know, and, and I'm like, man, if somehow, if you could get that, one of my cousins, he actually had all of the Star Wars toys. I mean, all these big things and all this stuff. We went over there one day, and we were just enamored by this because this had to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of toys. Hundreds. We've got a lost child here. Uh, hundreds of dollars worth of, of toys. Uh, oh, okay. She belongs over here. Okay. Uh, hundreds of dollars worth of toys, and, uh, and he wasn't that interested in them. We were over there just enamored with them, but what happened? What happens to your kids on Christmas? You give them the gift they want. You carefully picked out. You spent all their money. You may have even went into debt trying to buy it for them to make them happy. Why? Because they have to have it because all the other parents are getting that for their kids, and you don't want to be the bad parent. And so you get it for them. They open it up. They're happy. They love it. December 26th happens. And they come up to you, and they say, I'm bored. You're bored. I just, I just went into debt. I mean, our, your college education is in that toy right over there. You're bored. What, what happened? Nothing changed about the toy, did it? From one day to the next. Only the way they now looked at the toy. And I wonder if many times we are missing out on all the things God has surrounded with us currently. And we go to God and we say, I'm bored. And from God's perspective, he's like, I, I've got all this stuff. 
Nothing has changed. This was, nothing has changed except for the way you're looking at the stuff. And when we lose our appreciation, listen to this, if we lose our appreciation for what God has already given us, we're acting more childish than mature. We're acting more like the kid on December 26th than a mature person who's following after Jesus. God, now let me just even put this in a different perspective. How many of you guys know that, that God never changes? Yet how many times in our life has our appreciation of God changed depending on the circumstances, depending on what's going on? You find yourself appreciating God more? Listen, God never changes. What has changed? It's not on God's end. It's the way we look at God that changes in situation to situation. Listen, if you're in a situation right now and you're like, where's God? Listen, God's been there all the time. God does not change. Maybe it's the way we're looking at God that has changed. And because of that, our appreciation has gone down. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. How many of you guys have ever prayed and you got done praying and you were still anxious? Anybody? We mostly call that complaining, but that you can call that prayer if you like. <laughs> We, and there's nothing, I mean, we do that from time to time. I mean, we just pour out our heart to God, and there's nothing wrong with that. But listen, you can go and pray, and you're like, man, I pray. Why do I still feel anxious? See, Paul gives us an ingredient here as to how we can pray and walk away not anxious. You ready? It's right there. We, we, it's so simple we missed it, okay? It says, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. You see, if you just pray... That's fine. You may pray and walk away anxious. But if you can add thanksgiving to your prayer, you can walk away with the peace of God. Now let, me, let me just show you how this works. A couple years ago, God was really dealing with this with me. I was, I was battling probably all three of those things. I was, I was concerned with the things I had. I was concerned with things I didn't have. I was probably concerned with things that other people had and saying, man, why, why don't I have this and why don't I have that and why did this happen to them and not me? And, and I'm sitting there just kind of praying to God, right? Just praying to God. And it was like, I heard God talk to me like he talked to Martha in the Bible. He, he said something like this. You're anxious about many things, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, I am anxious about things. You know what? I've been doing this and diligent here, and I am anxious about many things. He's like, why are you anxious about many things? You're not supposed to be anxious. I was like, well, well, what am I supposed to do? And this is what God instructed me to do. I went out on my back deck, and I was just kind of staring off in the distance, and he said, I want you right now to only think about things that you can be thankful for. Only. I'm like, okay. So I started started to think about things I could be thankful for, and I had to be ruthless about it. He said, don't let anything in there that is not something of gratitude. And I began to be ruthless about it and only begin to think little things, big things, medium things, past things, just er only. And I sat there for like an hour to an hour and a half just in the thankfulness of everything, all the things that I had been missing all around me the whole time. And by the time I got done with that, guess what happened? My appreciation of God skyrocketed. My appreciation for what God had already driven off the lot for me just skyrocketed. Not a thing had changed about any of those things. And I was not, I just didn't get caught up in the, the more, the more, the more. You see, we think more is our solution, but it's not. How many of you guys have ever got into that idea that the grass is always greener on the other side, right? Grass is always greener. If I could only have this, then I would be happy. If I could only have a better house, then I would be happy. If I could only have a better car, then I would be happy. If I could only have a better job, then I'd be happy. If I could only have $50 more a month, then I'd be happy. If I could only have a better spouse, then I'd be happy. We get caught up. Come on, anybody? Am I talking to anybody here this morning? Two people? I'll take two. All right, can I get a third? Fourth, fifth, sixth. Got it. Okay. Just encouragement is rising up. I'm just preaching. The more I go, it's just going, getting better. It's getting better. We get caught up in this grass is greener on the other side. But here's the, here's the thing. How many of you guys have got caught up in that, if only this, then I'd be happy? How many of you guys have ever got the then, and you realize I wasn't happy? 
You got the then, but then that then was not happy anymore, right? And then so then you're like, well, okay, well, if only this then. And then you get the then, and then you're not happy still. Because success and external joy is always a moving target. As soon as you reach it, it's moved away from you. There is no way you will ever satisfy a spiritual need with an external fleshly fruit. You won't ever satisfy it that way. You won't do that. And so so we continue to play this grass is greener on the other side. It's false. You, the United States, how many of you guys believe the United States is the land of opportunity? Even though we've had financial ups and downs, it's still the best place that you could, you could have freedom and do all these things. How many of you guys believe that? I'm probably talking to the choir here, but we believe that. Do you realize in 2012, Gallup did a poll and they ranked the United States 33rd on the happiness scale. We have all this opportunity. We have all these, you know, all these benefits and things at our fingertips. And guess what? It doesn't make us happy. It doesn't. So what are we to do about that? Well, it's because God wants us to be grateful for what we already have. How many of you guys believe God is a provider? Anybody believe God is a provider? How many of you guys in different seasons of your life, you saw God provide for you, but at the same time you look back and you realize that God's provision in one season of my life was not the same number as a different season of my life. How many of you guys have realized that? But yet God still provided. It just at one point it was like, okay, it was over here. And another point it was over here. I was reading a book a couple years ago by Bill Hybels, and he said this statement that has really wrecked me and messed with me in a good way since, and it's caused me to live in a whole lot more joy. You guys ready for it? I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. It's powerful. It says, you will only know true financial peace when you learn to live joyfully beneath God's provision in every season of your life. joyfully beneath. You see, the key is joyfully. God is a provider. At every season of your life, God is a provider. He promises to do that. The question is, are we living joyfully beneath his level of provision? Here's what we do. You guys ready for this? I'm going to step on some toes because we've all probably been there before. Here's what we do. We look at at God's provision level for this season and we think, in comparison with other people, well, it's not enough. This isn't going to bring me joy. So what do we do? We go into debt to purchase the joy on the other side of God's provision. So we go to purchase joy on the other side. And have you guys know, there's no joy over there. There's joy for a moment, but then the bills start coming in. And so we go into debt and we start to try to purchase joy on the other side of God's provision. What we're saying is, God, your provision is not enough for me. How many of you guys know God's provision was there all along? God's provision was there all along. You don't need $50 more a month. You don't need a bigger, you don't need more. There's nothing wrong with those things. But here's what we have to get down. If we are going to let anxiousness fall away, because I tell you, it will latch right back onto you. If you get the then, it will latch right back on the new then. We have to learn to live joyfully beneath God's provision in every season of our life. Now, I'll give you an example. I've shared this before, but um, when we first moved down here, we were in a rental house. And we had four kids at the time. And how many of you parents know that if you live in a rental house with four kids, you never expect to get your deposit back, right? You just don't expect it. You write it off, it's done. There's, that's just, I invested that. God bless you. Go paint the house. New carpet. I'm sure we owe you more than that. You know, it's like one of those things. So I didn't, I didn't expect anything back. So we moved into a, a different house. We bought a house. And, and out of the blue, get the mail one day, I open up the envelope. And to my shock, it is like 80% of my rental deposit back. I am just shocked. It's a miracle of God. I'm like dancing. I'm like revivals just happened in my house. You know, I'm thinking we were living tight at that time. And so it's like, man, this was a game changer, like seven or 800 bucks. It was a game changer. And I'm just, we're just celebrating, just thinking about, man, what could we do with this money? And I kid you not, I set down that piece of mail 
How many of you guys know where this is going, right? I opened up the very, I promise you, the very next piece of mail that I picked up and I opened up in my joy, you know, and I opened it up and it was an unexpected bill for almost the exact same amount. And it was like God telling me in that moment, I got you, I provide for you, even before you need it, I provide for you. God didn't even give me time to spend it. I was like the very next piece of mail. Now, here's the problem. God is a provider. That's the truth. Most of us, God may provide for us, and we squander his provision. And then we accuse God of not being a provider. God's like, I provided for you. Last year, remember, I provided and you did not save. You squandered it. How many times have we accused God of not being a provider because we squandered, because we were not content with what God had? And so we tried to purchase joy on the other side of God's provision. It doesn't work that way. See, the antidote for anxiousness is the attitude of gratitude. Listen, we dishonor God by not appreciating what we already have. I know this is a simple message this morning, but I'm telling you, just because it's simple does not make it less powerful. If we get a hold of this, especially in our society, I'm telling you, many of you guys right now, your problems have been solved. Your anxiousness have been solved by point one. If you would just stop, there's nothing wrong with ambition. There's nothing wrong with going for more. But, but when it owns you and when it's creating anxiety in you, you're outside of God's will. You're outside of God's best. And we can try to live in peace outside of God's best, but how many of you guys know it sure is hard to live in peace outside of God's best? But when we get in the sweet spot of, of joyfully living where God has placed us, guess what? Peace just flows like a river. Peace can flow. Some of you guys, your, your anxiety issues, you put pressure on yourself to go from more to more to bigger to bigger to higher to higher. And again, nothing wrong with that if that's your season. But if that's not your season, whew, get planted in the gratefulness of what God has already given you. Get planted in what God has already given you. Now, uh, I love this old rabbinic saying, and it just it says this. I just love it. It says, God will one day hold us accountable for all the things he created for us to enjoy, but we refuse to do so. Do you know where most of those things are? They're in what you already have. We're trying to enjoy what we don't have. God says, if you apply this statement right here, guess what? Your life is going to be filled with enormous peace. Enormous peace. Enormous peace. Uh, most of what God wants us to enjoy is already right in front of us. I'm just talking about practically, okay? I'm talking about we live in the United States of America. I, if I was in a different country, I might have to preach a different sermon, but this is, this is for us. We have to be thankful for what we have. Now, Aaron and I were talking a couple uh, years ago, or yeah, it's probably a couple years ago now, about we were l lamenting our kids' desire to just sit in the house and play video games all day. Now, they just, I mean, or be on an iPad or be on a phone. Most, most teenagers today, you know, they, they've got a, their neck is growing this way, right? It's just, so now I, I say that, but how many of you adults? And now it's, it's bled over to us adults now. But our kids, you know, they just, they want to play video. I, I built this, this enormous structure for my daughter, this fortress thing out in the backyard in the trees. And it's got a slide that if you slid down it, you could potentially get hurt really bad. And that makes it really cool. And so I built this whole thing and she hardly ever wants to go out there. And so we were just talking about this with our kids. It's like, why, you know, how many of you guys, when you grew up, you grew up playing outside all the time. How many of you guys grew up? See, my mom in the summer would lock the door and lock us outside. How many of you guys were that? We had access to a garden hose and that was it. And we knew when it was dark, come home. But other than that, we were outside all day long. I think with five kids, she had had it and that was it. Just send them outside, lock the doors. And so that's how we grew up. And so we were kind of talking about, man, I wish our kids would want to do that. But all they want is maybe another app or another game or another phone or whatever it is. And we could do that for them. And all it would do is perpetuate that continual desire for another thing and another thing and another thing. But we began to, to talk and we was like, what, what if we could just somehow change their desire 
from wanting to play video games to wanting to be outside and enjoy, instead of us buying something new, enjoy what they already had. What if it was simply we could somehow change their desire? And I wonder if that's how God looks at us. We're constantly going to God and we're asking for more. We're asking for more. We're asking for blessing. We're asking for something else. And God may be looking at you this morning and say, I just wish I could change your desire. You don't need more. You just need to look around at what I've already blessed you with. You're not supposed to look at it compared to someone else. You're supposed to just look at it between you and God. Because you might say, well, well, Sean, if I look compared to everyone else, then it looks like I got the short end of the stick. Well, of course. You're always going to find somebody to compare to and, and come up on that end. So if we could enjoy what's already there, peace would come amazingly fast, more, quicker than you think. It's so simple that we probably won't do it. So how, how do we do this? Well, point number two, because that, that was just point number one. Point number two, got to get moving, is we have to create a gratitude ecosystem on the inside of us. You see, some of us need some climate change on the inside of our heart because that inner song that's stuck on repeat is stuck on worry, anxiety, and fear. And we need to change that, but it doesn't change when the externals change. It only changes when the internals change. And so to do that, I'm going to show this illustration. So let's roll. This is my smoker. Today, I'm offering up a heavenly incense up to the Lord. It's biblical, a sweet smelling aroma. It's a pleasing sacrifice up into the Lord. Mm, anybody hungry yet? All right, so Pastor Aaron used a version of this illustration, and Chris Valentin talks about it all the time, but it's a great illustration. Uh, I've got apple wood, I've got cherry wood, uh, and I love to smoke these ribs, and man, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Uh, but the thing is, as good as I am at holding the temperature there, and I can get the, the wood just there just right and get it just the right temperature, eventually I'm going to have to feed it because it's going to die down. The fire is going to die down, and I'm going to have to continue continually stoke the fire. And if I don't, what will happen? Eventually, this smoker will become the temperature that it is outside. So if it's 70 degrees outside, eventually the smoker is going to be 70 degrees inside. Why? Because the smoker doesn't have a climate system. It doesn't have an ecosystem. Now, as good as my smoker is, and as much as I love it, I can't keep a temperature there indefinitely. It's not as good as my oven. Why? Because I just have a thermometer here. I don't have a thermostat. My oven has a thermostat. So theoretically, as long as I had power and, and stuff, electricity, I could keep the temperature inside my oven at, at a certain temperature indefinitely. Why? Because it has a thermostat, not just a thermometer. Now, it, here's how it applies to our life. If our joy and our peace is all, uh, it's all about incidents that happen to us instead of an ecosystem that happens in us, that's cultivated in us, then our joy won't remain. It just won't stay. And so we need to be thermostats on the inside instead of thermometers, just measuring the circumstances around us. See, we ought to be able to walk into a room and not just measure measure the temperature of what's going on in that room or not just uh, the temperature of what's going on in a situation. We ought to be thermostats and being able to set what's going to happen in the situation. Why? Because of a climate, an ecosystem that's developed on the inside of us. How do we do that? Well, we do that through a word called practice. We'll look at that here in just a little bit. Practice. Well, in John 14, 27, it talks about how Jesus says, peace I give you, peace I leave with you. Not as the world li leaves, but, but peace from God. So the question isn't, does Jesus give us peace? The question is, are we practicing the peace that Jesus gives us? You know, it talks about in Philippians, it says to rejoice. What does rejoice mean? It simply means to re-joy. It means to joy over and over and over again. And when we do that on the inside, we create a climate, we create an ecosystem that stays, that remains. That's how we create an ecosystem of joy and gratitude on the inside of us. All right, so are you a smoker or an oven? Do you have a, just a, a thermometer or are you the thermostat? How do we have the thermostats? Well, we, we shouldn't give, let me just say it this way. Don't give your worry thermostat rights on the inside. Don't give them thermostat rights. 
How do we do that? That word I just talked about, the word is called practice. We have to practice the attitude of gratitude. How many of you guys aren't very good at this, at being thankful for things? Anybody just own that? All right, that's me. All right, so I'm, you know, sometimes if I find I'm not very good at something, what do I have to do? I have to practice it. So how can we practice it? Let me give you three quick things and, and, and see if this helps anybody out. They're going to be simple, but again, apply them and see what happens this week. Key number one, we have to give gratitude the megaphone. We have to give gratitude the megaphone. Too often our worries have the microphone and the megaphone and everything in our life. If you go around and you listen to yourself talk, if we were to record you and play it back, all it would be is anxiety, worry, this problem, that problem, negative person, negative attitude. And you've given worry and negativity and stress the megaphone in your life. There is no way you're going to have peace if all that you hear from yourself is negativity. All you hear of yourself is anxiety. All that you hear of your yourself is tension. You're not going to experience peace. Again, go back to Philippians chapter four, verse eight and nine. Fi finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You see, whenever you just begin to broadcast through the megaphone of your life all of the good things that God is doing, this isn't being dishonest with what's actually happening. It's simply choosing what gets the microphone. There's things in your life that you could broadcast. It's not saying there isn't. It's simply saying, I am making a decision by faith to broadcast, to use the megaphone of gratitude and to be thankful for what God has given me. That meditate means several things. It's not about emptying the mind like Eastern religion. It's about filling ourselves up with the, the things that God has blessed us with. Now, some of you guys aren't, aren't convinced. You're like, how can this one little thing make this big of a difference in my life? Well, listen, they did a study in, in, of about 1,000 people from ages 8 to 80, and they found that people who practice gratitude consistently report a host of benefits. All right, you ready for the benefits? Physical, that they had stronger immune systems. They were less bothered by aches and pains. They had lower blood pressure. They, they exercised more and took better care of their health. They slept longer and felt more refreshed upon waking up. How many of you guys would take that right there? Okay, there's a lot of pills on the market right now that promise to do that. But if you could do this, you would save a lot of money right there. You'd save a lot of doctor's visits, save a lot of time. All right, psychological, higher levels of positive emotions, more alert, alive, awake, more joy, more pleasure, more optimism and happiness, social, more helpful, generous, compassionate. They became more forgiving, more outgoing. They felt less lonely and isolated. Does this sound good to anybody? Wouldn't this, isn't this the kind of life that we desire and the kind of life that God wants us to have? It's not that we can't have it. It's just that we got to do it God's way. We just have to do it God's way. How many of you guys have ever said this to your kids before? If you don't have anything good to say, what? Don't say anything at all. How many of you guys have ever tried that yourself? Listen, there's different seasons in my life. If I actually put this into practice, there'd be nothing coming out of my mouth, right? <laughs> They're just, whoa, okay, I don't have a lot to say that's good, you know? And it's because it's those moments when we realize I've had a song in my heart that's a song of negativity. And I got to change the tune. All right. Key number two, write it down. Again, this is very simple. Write it down. Uh, Matthew chapter six, verse 31. Therefore, don't be anxious about anything. What shall we are saying? What, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Most of the time, if we were really honest, if we write anything down, it has to do with our worries and not our worship. In fact, if you look at most of your to-do list, it's more of a worry list, <laughs> I got to pay this bill. I got to go to do this thing. I got to check this off. I got to do that. And we're worried. We're filling up our to-do lists as anxious lists. What if we were to flip the tables on that and simply make lists of things that we were thankful for, that we had gratitude, and we began to list those things out? You realize how powerful that would be? Uh, I believe it would be powerful uh, more than you think it would be. A couple months ago, I had this idea. I believe it sparked from God. 
I was kind of just going through something and I was just had this idea. I've got these journals, like these leather bound journals that just have blank pages in them. Uh, in fact, my My in-laws get them for me for Christmas. So I was like, what do I do with this thing? Because I I love to have leather-bound journal things and stuff like that because I just love the way it looks and stuff and fancy pens and stuff. And so God God spoke to me. He's like, here's what I want you to do with that. And he he said, you need to write a book. Like, okay, write a book. What's the book about? He said, I want you to write a book of encouragement. And it's only for you. And so I began, I just started this week even to continue to, to write down some things inside this, this book. And I titled it The Book of Encouragement. And it's my book. And I'm writing down and I'm going to catalog and I'm going to think through all the things, the prophecies of God over my life, I'm starting to write down in this book. The times that God has physically healed me, I'm writing them down. The, the times when God did miracles for me or brought encouragement or brought a word or brought a situation, I'm writing it down. Why? Whenever I get discouraged, I'm going back to the book of encouragement. I can take the word of God in this book. You know what that is? That's, that's the, the word of God. And then it's the testimony. And I can look. You realize the reason many times we, we don't think God is faithful is not because God hasn't been faithful. It's simply because we've forgotten. And so I'm determined that I'm going to have a book that whenever, and you know what, I'll just catalog everything that's happened up to this point, but I just, I just started to imagine, what is my life, how many volumes of this book will there be when I get towards the end of my life? And I began to look at all these volumes of this book of encouragement. Do you know what? As I write those things down, and as I began to write those things down, do you realize what happened to me? Even just in the few I've already written down. Whew, peace of God. I was struggling with something. I began to write it down and I was writing down a, a, a prophecy that somebody prophesied over me. And it was just like, no, don't get, don't be discouraged in doing good. Remember, this was prophesied over you. You realize how powerful that is? See, as we write these things out, so simple, but my anxiety began to disappear. Key number three, and then we're done. We're going to receive communion after that. But key number three is to build some stop signs in our life. So what do you mean by that? Build some stop signs. Well, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, let's read it again, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The word think means literally to calculate. It means not simply thinking about the things, but thinking about them as though you were calculating the cost of committing yourself to them in action. In other words, it's a much deeper, deeper word. Whenever we build some, listen, we are running at such a fast pace in our life. Maybe the reason why we don't have peace, maybe the reason why we can't think of anything that God has been faithful to us, maybe the reason why we can't find anything to be thankful for is because we simply need some stop signs to tell us to stop and to calculate. For some of you, it may be as simple as a time every single morning. This is a devotional time that you stop and you calculate. For some of you, it may be that you're not practicing the Sabbath and you need to stop and practice the Sabbath. For others of you, there could be a variety of different ways that God tells you and speaks to you to put a stop sign in your life. But without the stop sign, you won't ever stop to think and to calculate. And here's a spiritual truth that I want you to catch. catch because right now you may be looking at your life and you say, listen, I, I've got all kinds of trials going on in my life. I can't, how can I find something to be thankful for? Listen, God doesn't tell us to be thankful for the trial. He tells us that we can be, we can have peace and thanksgiving in the trial, right? You may be in a trial right now. I guarantee you, if you stop, you'll find something. Here's what I want you to catch. Whatever you're looking for, you'll find. If you're looking for bad things, you'll find them. If you're looking for things to get stressed out about, you'll find them. If you're looking for people to be mad at, you'll find them. If you're looking for someone to blame, you'll find it. But I'm telling you, if you look... For the goodness of God, you will find it. So I'm going to do something here at the end. Somebody might find cheesy or something like that. But I just saw us, I saw this kind of maybe being a tumbler for something that clicks into place for somebody. And I'm going to show you a video about five minutes long. This is from a Benedictine monk, of all people, who's talking about that we can find things to be thankful for 
everywhere we look. Let's roll. You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you today. It's given to you. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you do nothing else but to cultivate that response to the great gift that this unique day is, if you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. We just think of the weather, and even of the weather we don't think of all the many nuances of weather. We just think of good weather and bad weather. This day, right now, is unique weather. Maybe a kind that will never exactly in that form come again. The formation of clouds in the sky will never be the same that is right now. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. A story that you could never fully fathom. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. We all go back so far. And in this present moment, on this day, all the people you meet, all that life from generations and from so many places all over the world, flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. You turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water and drinkable water. It's a gift that millions and millions in the world uh, will never experience. So these are just a few of an enormous number of gifts to which we can open your heart. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you that everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your eyes, by your smile, by your touch, just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. then it will really be a good day. Because we have so much to be thankful for, okay? Uh, we have so much. Would you guys just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? And just as a starting point to practice, I know this may not be where it's at. You may have to 
struggle through this on your own, try just for a moment to shut out all other distractions and to only think about the things to be thankful for that God has blessed you with. Instead of the constant, if only this, then I would be happy. But right now, even in the midst of a trial or a situation, even in the midst of turmoil, there's so much that God has placed in your life right now. Lord, we thank you for so much that you've given us and blessed us with. This is an act of worship right now that you're partaking in right now, guys. It's an act of worship to, to offer our gratitude to God even to offer our contentment to God. And for some of us, it may be a sacrifice. But Hebrews 15, 13, 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I'd rather sacrifice my thanksgiving to God than sacrifice my joy and peace to the enemy. So for some of you, if it's a sacrifice, just understand there's fruit on the other side. It's a fruit of peace. So Lord, right now, we just offer up our thanksgiving, our gratitude right now. Lord, I just bind up any anxiety or anxiousness and we just say it falls to the ground right now. And let the peace of God flow in this place as we become people who are constantly reminding ourselves of all of your goodness, of all of the great things that you've already blessed us with. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Would you guys stand up with me? We're gonna get ready to receive communion. And as we do, we've got tables in front, tables in back. And as we do this, we're gonna come and we're gonna take the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus. Do you realize if you have nothing else to be thankful for right now, you, if you are saved and in Christ, you can be thankful that the blood of Jesus has washed away all of your sins. No matter what you're going through right now, that's more than enough right there. That the blood of Jesus, that your past is in the past and that you are a brand new creation. And we're gonna take the, the cup, we're gonna take the, the cracker, which represents the body of Jesus, that represents the healing for us physically, emotionally, and be thankful. And as we come down, just maybe even as a point of faith, as you come to the table, you know, the, the word, giving thanks in, he, in Ephesians chapter five is the same word that talks about in Mark 14 when Jesus was doing the last supper. And it says when he had given thanks, that same word is, is Eucharist or it's a variation of it. Have you guys have heard of the Eucharist before? The Eucharist is simply communion. And that word simply means thanksgiving. And so today, as we come to the table, we're just gonna offer up our gratitude and as a point of faith, let anxiety fall away, let thanksgiving rise up. I'm gonna pray and then you can come and take that and take that back to your seat. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you're doing. Let us be people of gratitude. Let us be people who are filled with your peace, not because we desire more, but because we're joyfully living in the season that you have us. We declare that we're thankful for your blood, for your sacrifice and for your victory on the cross, wiping away all of our sins so that we can live in fellowship with God. We thank you for that in Jesus name. Amen.